so the next thing we're going to look at is actually how the gamma camera operates and functions. So we're going to break down this detector head, so this detector head into its, all of its components and talk about each one of them and how they actually work. And this is just a general introduction, so obviously the, the uh, physics instrumentation can be quite detailed. We're just going to actually scrape the surface of it to give you a general understanding of how it works. Of course the first part of the process is actually the patient. So we've administered the radiopharmaceutical to the patient. It's important to keep in mind that this gamma camera is not radioactive itself. It's a radiation detector. So it doesn't emit x-rays or anything like that. So what we do is we administer a radiopharmaceutical to the patient. It goes to the person, um, different organs in the patient's body, and then we actually are uh, imaging as by distribution. So if this pillow here happens to be the patient, and we want to image what's coming out of the patient, it's really important to keep in mind that if we just randomly take photons coming out in all directions, then our image is not going to be very successful. So what we need to do is actually ensure that when we've actually got the camera positioned in this position, so let's say anterior in this particular case, that the only photons that we detect are those that are actually coming out perpendicular to the ga gamma camera itself. Because if we accepted photons that came from, say, here, travelling in this line, well then, when we actually generate our image, a photon that started here, travels in this direction and gets detected over here, means that on our image, this is where it actually per perceives it to come from. So you get that co-location error. Okay, so we put the dot, essentially, in the wrong spot on the camera. So this collimator is called a physical discriminator. And its job is to ensure, or try to ensure, that what we do is eliminate photons that come at the wrong angle. Okay, so I'll describe how we do that in just a second. But it's important to have that perspective that from the patient point of view, that everything that's coming out of the patient in a plain R way, so we want photons that are coming out perpendicular to the camera, so photons that are coming out at an angle are removed from the image. And that's done with this physical discriminator. So let's go back to our old camera so the old GE, because it's easy for me to pull apart. And we can see here on the front is this collimator. So this is the collimator here. Typically they're made of lead or tungsten, and all they are is um, essentially a bunch of holes that ensure that photons come in in the right direction. And so it slots on the front there. It's quite heavy, 60 to 80 kilograms is not un un uncommon. And its job is to absorb photons that come in the wrong direction. So I've pulled a couple of these off, and I'm going to show you a couple here now. So this one here is called a low energy um, all purpose camera, which means that it's designed for um, technetium in 140 keV, so lower energies. And it's also all purpose, which means it's not high resolution and it's not high sensitivity. And what that translates to is, is that if you can see these holes, okay, all these little holes, they're hexagonal holes, so you can see it's a hexagonal array. And the thickness of the lead and these are the lead ones, not tungsten, so these are the old style. And so the thickness of the lead um, produce scepter. They're called the scepter. And the thickness of that lead will be determined by the actual, both the resolution, but also sensitivity and energy. So because we're dealing with low energy, these scepter can be quite thin because we're only dealing with 140 keV. So it means that if a photon comes directly from me to here, if it hits the scepter right on the end, then even though it's coming in a parallel pathway, it'll actually be removed from the image. So you don't want those to be too thick because it will decrease the sensitivity. So the only reason we'd increase the thickness is if we actually needed better septal absorption and that would be associated with a higher energy photon. So here's our little uh, holes. And so essentially our photon would come through and if it's coming in the right direction, so parallel to the camera, it would actually go through uh, those holes. If it came at an angle, then it'd be absorbed by the scepter. You can see over here these lines, these marks, that's just poor technologist technique. So when they're putting these things on and off, they've scraped it across things. And because lead is uh, very malleable or soft, then it actually ends up with these scars. And you can see here, you can probably appreciate here that the actual integrity of those holes has changed. So some of those holes have folded over a bit and the scepter have got thicker. So that would create artifact in your device. Now I'm just going to scan over across here, and just to compare, you can actually see, and I'll put my fingers there again so you can see the size, this is a medium energy collimator, so this is designed for something like gallium or thallium, sorry, gallium or um, uh, indium, 
um, not thallium, so thallium is still low energy. Um, and so you can see here that the scepter are slightly bigger compared to the, the other one. And not only are they slightly bigger, but the, uh, sorry, the holes are slightly bigger, but the scepter is slightly thicker. And that's to absorb the higher energy photons of the gallium or other products like indium. Um, so uh, we might also use this. Some people would use a medium energy for ID123. Um, some people would use a low energy. So, uh, so you can see here there's slightly bigger holes and slightly thicker scepter. And you can also see some, some marks on there as well. So I'll just scan at the same height back from one to the other so you can see the size of the holes. And I might actually just take a photo of that and actually crop it into the video as well so you can appreciate it. So we're going to start to build a diagram of the gamma camera. We're actually going to do it um, horizontally across. Um, you can see here we've actually started to draw in the collimator. So this is where our collimator would be on the front end of that uh, detector. And the green lines um, represent the, the overall detector size. So we're going to work through that and slowly build that image across the screen. This here is actually representing the, um, the actual collimator itself. And as you can see with the red lines, that you've actually got emission of a photon and if it's parallel to those scepter, so the black lines being the scepter for the collimator, and so the red lines are photons coming in. And so you can see that if the photon actually comes directly parallel, then it passes through the collimator and, and it will be detected on this side um, by the crystal, which we'll talk about in a few minutes time. If it comes at an angle, then obviously it um, hits one of the scepter and is absorbed um, by the lead or tungsten of the scepter. So this brings us to resolution and what we actually can do is we actually have this angle theta that is defined by the line drawn from the two ends of, um, of a single hole. And so obviously that represents, as we scan down, uh, the angle that a photon could come without actually being um, ejected from your data collection um, based on not being parallel. So if we extend that down, we can actually see that the further away from the collimator, you can imagine if the patient's down at this end, so the patient's down at this end, the further the patient or the object of interest is from that detector, the bigger that angle would then have an error that would co um, result in a local localization error. So this actually impacts on the resolution and that's actually going to be experiment one, that if you look at the other YouTube clips. So we've actually identified that a photon um, occurred here somewhere so we actually pan back down to here. Um, so this is where we actually say it occurred, but it could have actually occurred all the way out here because of that, um, that angle theta. So what happens after a photon either passes through the collimator or, or doesn't? So we have that physical discriminator and then it will actually, those events that make it through will actually encounter what's called the crystal. Now you can't see what's going on inside this detector head because it's got this lead casing around it. So a big old lead casing. Um, and so here's one I prepared earlier where I pulled that detector apart and uh, it's the same detector and this is what's essentially inside that. So you can actually see uh, this, this ring is where the crystal is. So this is just a stainless steel uh, ring that's holding the crystal in. The crystal is this part here and you can see that there's a bit of goo on it. That's optical coupling, I'll talk about in a second. And it's got this hexagonal array of photomultiplier tubes. And then up the top, they're coupled to pre-amplifiers and, and shaping circuits. So we'll go through that process in a second. Uh, you can't really appreciate what the crystal is. But it's that white stuff that's, uh, that's in there. It's actually um, translucent, so um, light will pass through it a little bit. It is frosted. I can't really show you the other side because it's actually got a covering on it. And so that covering is actually just 
I will actually pop underneath the table and show you a little bit of it. It's too heavy to pull up, but it's got a covering on it. And that, that's used for QC, those, those markers where we know a PM tube, a photomultiplied tube sits underneath it. So there's not much I can do to show you under there, but this is the side that's important because what occurs on the black side is if I actually held a radioactive source on the other side and turned the lights down, you would actually get a, a light purple hue, a little bit of light purple scintillation on the other side. And that's why it's called a scintillation detector. And I'll explain how that works in just a second. So that's, uh, that's the actual detector um, pulled apart. So how the crystal works itself, if we come back to our diagram on the board, is that uh, let's get nice and close to where an event occurred. So we're looking at this red event and the red event has actually come through the patient, comes out through the collimator and it encounters this blue area. So this blue uh, lined area is our crystal. And our crystal is called a sodium iodide crystal and it has a thallium impurity in it. And what that thallium impurity in it does is just makes it a little bit more efficient at actually converting trap photons into light emissions. So it's called a scintillation detector because what happens is that the photon comes through and the energy of the photon interacts with the crystal and causes excitation. And that excitation, represented here by the purple, results in excitation. It drops back to ground state, which then gives off energy in the form of light. And that light, represented there by the orange waves, is given off in the form of, uh, of you know, the, the ultraviolet, just slightly ultraviolet, so there's some of it is just outside the visible spectrum, and then of course the purple end of the, the visible spectrum as well, so we'd get a little bit of purple light. And that's called scintillation. So that's the next part of the process, is actually converting the energy of the photon into light. So it traps it via excitation, it causes excitation, moving uh, that uh, electron moving back to its shell, gives off energy in the form of light or scintillation, and then we're actually going to detect that scintillation in the next part using photomultiplier tubes. So we've started to fill that out a little bit. Let's talk about photomultiplier tubes. And this is actually a really important part of the device because it converts the light into some sort of electrical impulse. And so you can see here in this pulled apart gamma camera, there's a whole array of photomultiplier tubes. Um, the top end of these are, are black protecting some, some electronic circuitry. You can see there's a tube in here and that tube is in a vacuum and then uh, you can see that they fit into a hexagonal array um, and this can be adjusted in and out to hold those in a nice compact way. The op uh, optical couplings, this goo, this gel that you can see um, is quite viscous and what it's designed is actually to provide that coupling of the PM tube to the crystal so that you don't lose light. In a similar way to you use ultrasound gel um, between the transducer and the patient so you don't have that air pocket that um, affects the transmission of light. So let's have a look at uh, one of these PM tubes. Now before we do, we might actually look at the old style. Um, and so what we actually have in the PM tube is that uh, at this end you can see a little brown window and that brown window is called the photocathode. And then what we have is you can see that there's a reflection um, uh, foil around that. And then we're gonna talk about this uh, in terms of uh, a diagram in just a second. But you can see these levels, and these are called dynodes, and they're at different levels um, to accelerate. So photomultiplier tube essentially means that you're actually converting a f um, you know, visible light or light into a current and amplifying it. And then you've got an anode at the other end that results in an impulse coming out. Okay, so um, keep that in mind when we actually look at the, the actual um, diagrammatic representation of a set. So the newer systems, so the newer systems, hexagonal, so that old one was a round one, so hexagonal uh, field of view, you've still got a window in there that has this um, uh, reflective, so this is just to trap the light in, so if it wasn't there then light could uh, come out through the, the um, chamber. And then you've got this vacuum with your um, dynodes inside. It's a bit harder to appreciate in this one, which is why I like to show you the old one, because it actually has them in layers. And then of course uh, a preamp. Um, and shaping circuit that then links up to your amplifiers up top. So how does all that work? So the idea is, is that you've got this array of PM tubes coupled 
to your crystal and this is two-dimensional of course and so what you've now got is you've got these things that are designed to detect light detecting light so so this PM tube picks up some light and this one picks up some light and this one picks up some light as we move down they pick up different amounts of light so I'll come back to how that works in just a second when we but what we're going to first do is look at actually how the PM tube works and the PM tube works by having light hit the photocathode, so that little brown element, and it pops an electron off the other side, and this is in a vacuum. And based on charge, we've got these dynodes of different charge levels through the PM tube. So what will happen is, is that this will accelerate towards this one, and it's coated with a similar material to the photocathode, and because it's been accelerated through a vacuum, it has more energy when it gets here, so it bounces a few extra electrons off. And so then they're accelerated to the next level because this is a slightly higher charge and then because it accelerates through that vacuum it results in even more being bounced off and it moves through the pm tube that way and that's how it actually amplifies the signal coming through and so then you end up with a signal coming out through the anode at the other end So let's talk about what now happens to those signals that come out. So you can imagine that the signals that come out, even though they've been amplified through the PM tube, the size of those signals or the amplitude of those signals will differ depending on how much light the PM tube detected. So in this scenario, where the event occurred here, well then these two PM tubes that are closest, so, so this one here, okay, so you're gonna end up with an amplitude that's higher than ones that are further away. Okay, so what I've tried to do right there is in black on the side, is put an amplitude in based on the amount of light that would be detected. So the light is detected here, it's amplified through that PM tube, and you end up with an impulse coming out. If the PM tube is closer to the event, like this one is, then you're gonna have a higher signal here, so it's gonna be amplified higher at the other end, and so your amplitude's gonna be slightly higher. Okay, so this is what we actually do in what's called um, essentially position circuitry is that what we're actually looking for now is um, two things we'll talk about the position circuitry first and then we'll talk about the pulse height analyzer and so how we decide within this scope so where in here did this actually event occur is going to be based on the amplitude of um, these individual events so the first thing we're going to do is come back over to this side and actually look at Imagine that these are a couple of PM tubes um, on a horizontal array. And so let's pretend for a minute that an event occurred here. Okay, so this is where the event occurred, right between two PM tubes, right in the middle of two PM tubes. So what will happen in that case is that when you actually look at what each PM tube sees, is that these two PM tubes will see an amplitude that is exactly the same. Okay, so you'll see those amplitude is exactly the same because I'll see an even distribution of light. And the ones on either side of those will also see the same amount. And so automatically you can actually start to see, well, if we actually plot that, if we actually plot that, what we can see is the amplitude is going to correspond to where that event occurred. Sorry about the crooked line. Okay, so the amplitude is going to correspond to where the event occurred. So that's actually pretty easy because it's right in the middle. The same thing would occur is that if you actually had an event that occurred right in the middle of an individual PM tube. So in this particular case, and we'll do it in purple, the event occurred here. So when we actually look at our um, light output, if we look at the amplitude of the light output, then you're gonna have your maximum there and because it's right in the middle here, then the two adjacent ones are going to see exactly the same amplitude of light. So the same thing applies. You end up where your actual peak is, that is actually where your event occurred. So we actually project that back down and that's where the event occurred. Now if that happened to be that this event occurred, well, let's go back to the middle one here, slightly to one side, 
then all of a sudden is the amount of light that this one sees versus this one versus this one will be proportional. There will be a ratio based on proximity. So, so this one is going to see more than this one because it's slightly closer. And the relationship or the ratio of light between this one and this one will actually represent um, the, where the actual position circuitry occurs or where the position circuitry decides the event occurs. Okay, so for that way, we can actually use that light um, for position circuitry. So what that position circuitry does, it gives us an X and a Y coordinate. So when you actually look at that position circuitry on both the X and the Y plane, looking at those amplitudes, you end up with an X and a Y coordinate of where an individual event occurred. So you get a dot on the screen basically, or a, not quite a dot on the screen because it's got to go through its pulse height analyzer next. Now we talked about the collimator being a physical discriminator, the pulse height analyzer or PHA is actually an electronic discriminator or an energy discriminator. And so what we actually now have is, is if we look at the, um, the light detected by each of those PM tubes and we actually pull all the light into a signal, a single signal. Okay, so now we're not actually looking at it to get that X and Y signal. We're not looking at it individually to find your position circuitry or you find your position using your position circuitry. What we're doing is actually pooling all of that data, all of that light into a signal, a sig, single signal. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue twister. Okay, a single signal. And what we have is a single amplitude. And then when we actually look at that summation of light is that we can actually set a window. And that window represented by those horizontal lines will be an energy. So if this is 140 keV, we might set our window 10% either side of that, so about 126 to 154 keV. And we're essentially saying that unless the amplitude of this event occurs within that window, it's not going to be a valid event. Okay, and we'll eliminate it from our photo, our, our image. Okay, so if we actually get another event that actually only has an amplitude here, then it is eliminated from the actual image. So what this allows us to do is actually only include events that occur approximately plus or minus 10%, 140 keV, okay, for technetium or any other particular radionuclide and its energy. So then this gives us our Z signal, okay? So we only get a Z signal if the photon, the accumulated uh, energy of, or light of the photon results in an amplitude that sits in the range predetermined and for technetium 100 and say 26 to 154 so about um, plus or minus um, 10 percent so that gives us our z signal when we get a z signal that x and y position then gives a dot on the screen so we put a dot on the screen where that x y position is when we get a z signal and you end up with one dot on your screen when you get a million of those we have a nice pretty picture if it falls outside of that and you can actually have it go above it as well so it can go above the line or below the line then it actually is eliminated from the image um, and only photons that are in the range uh, pass through the pulse light analyzer now what that allows us to do is coming back to this scenario is it allows us to actually discriminate against events that let's say an event occurred here it went in the patient this way interacted in the patient in some way and was scattered and came through in that way. Okay, so these are scatter events that would then be detected by the photon, sorry, by the pulse, um, sorry, it would actually generate um, light through scintillation in the crystal and then that light would be detected by the photomultiplier tubes and generate a, um, a signal coming out. You would end up with an XY, but the difference is, is that you would end up with something like this because you've lost energy in this initial interaction. So this interaction drops energy, even though it comes through at the same direction, the amount of excitation that occurs in the crystal is reduced, the amount of light that is produced is reduced, the summation of all of these results in a lower amplitude here and because of your energy discriminator it falls short of your window and doesn't get included in your image. So you're able to eliminate some scattered images, um, scattered events 
from your image in that way.